Uh, hi everyone. Um, thank you very much for your introduction and thank you very much for the invitation uh, to speak here at this workshop. Um, so my name is Kwang Kwan Liu. I'm currently a research fellow. Um, and today I'll be talking about uh, distributed graph techniques in the MPC model. Um, and I'll specifically define the MPC model that I'll be talking about. Um, and just as a quick disclaimer, um, I tried getting a crash course on uh, database theory um, by asking ChatGPT to give me a crash course. Um, but unfortunately, um, I still lack a lot of knowledge. So I apologize ahead of time um, if I don't quite understand your database theory questions in terms of queries. Um, hopefully, some members of the audience can translate these questions to me um, in graph theoretic terms. OK. So um, let me start um, with the definition of the MPC model that I will specifically be talking about in terms of graphs. Um, so you'll see that this is um, a somewhat different model than what uh, Paris and uh, Xiao talked about in their presentation. Um, but I'll discuss the similarities and the differences between these two models. So the MPC model that I'll be talking about um, for my presentation consists of M machines. Um, and unlike the database model, we're considering synchronous rounds. So we often have algorithms that take O of log log N rounds. So not just one round, two rounds. Um, so we're considering synchronous rounds. Great. In our model, we also have synchronous rounds. Uh, but your one round algorithms can. Yeah, can but, be but synchronous. Algorithms are ah, yes, the multi round algorithms are synchronous. Yeah, we generally don't really talk about one round algorithms yes. in our setting. Right. So we have, we have M machines here. Um, and when you're given some graph, you partition the edges among the machines. Um, and the edges are partitioned arbitrarily. So for each of the machines, uh, the, each individually has some S space. So S is an important parameter for us. And each of the machines can perform some local computation. After they compute the computation, they can talk to each other via rounds of communication. Okay, So the total space you can calculate to be m times s. But specifically, the complexity measure that we care about for this model here uh, is the total space that we use, uh, the space per machine, and the number of rounds of communication. So you are also ignoring the time taken by each machine. Time. Uh, we're not considering the time taken by each machine. Uh, most of our algorithms are near linear time, but for this for this uh, model, we're not considering the amount of time each machine takes. Yes. Because we had the question before the time that uh, the space that you need for the local computation is it also part of this S or? Yes. The space uh, needed for the computation per machine is S. OK, so that's a different yes. to what we had before, right? Before, it was only the data that we received that we had to store and not the computation space. I mean, before, you're considering the load, which is the amount of data divided by this uh, number of machines to a factor. Okay. So this is the space per machine corresponds with the, the load. OK, but not completely, right? I had the impression in the previous talk the load was the quantity of data received by a machine, and then you did not account for the data used locally in this machine during the computation. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, the question but, is if you use extra data in some yes. computation that is not the data you received, do you count this as part of S? Yes, we count this as part of S. So I guess it's a, this is a slight difference. Yes. Mm -hmm. Generally, our amount of extra space is constant overhead. So there is a slight difference here. Yes. So this is a comparison of the models. Um, this is also reproduced here on this on this board here. Um, so I want to emphasize that the complexity measures that we really want to um, minimize are the number of rounds and the space per machine for our model. So we can have a discussion um, during our discussion uh, part of uh, this workshop about the differences and similarities between the models. Um, but I sort of don't want to get into this discussion here right now. 
Um, but I just want to emphasize that for our setting, we are considering total space that's linear in the size of the graph that you're given, near linear in the size of the graph, of two polywell factors. So the size of the graph is defined in terms of n, the number of vertices, and m, the number of edges. And what you want to do is you want to minimize the space per machine um, and the number of rounds of com computation. And the number of machines you can then calculate to be the total space divided by the space of the machine. Yes? So the number of machines is somewhat data dependent then, right? Because if it's yes. a constant, then you could just, nothing would prevent you from sending all the data to one machine yeah. and solving it there in zero time. Right. So the number of machines as defined here is um, dependent on the size of the data. And this is kind of like, so it's more than logarithmic, right? It's something like n to the some exponent. Um, so, um, potentially, potentially, if you're considering S to be sublinear in the number of vertices, then it's M, potentially some exponent greater than one. And in fact, we do consider S to be sublinear in N for some of the regimes. And I'll specifically talk about the regimes I don't care about. Um, but for now, let's just consider these two models to be different. And we can have a discussion later about how they're similar, how they're exactly they're different. Um, and I just want to also mention that a lot of our algorithms, if we can, if they can work in the setting where it's sublinear in N, most of our algorithms can also work for larger space per machine. So if it works for the sublinear setting, it can also work for larger space per machine, most of our algorithms. Okay, so in terms of uh, this parameter space per machine, we have three settings. So we consider what's called a strongly sublinear memory setting. So in this setting, we have the space per machine to be s equals n to the delta for some constant delta in 0, 1. So this is a, uh, this is a different delta than what's shown here. So we have constant delta in, um, the, uh, in the range 0, 1. We also have the near linear memory uh, regime, which is uh, when the space per machine is near linear in the number of nodes in your input. So ignoring some polylog factors. And we also have strongly sublinear memory in which uh, your space per machine is n to the one plus delta for some constant greater than zero. So normally when you want to consider um, a smaller number of machines, you're in the strongly uh, super linear memory setting. Yes. So we discussed it yesterday. Yes. Why do you characterize memory with respect to n, which is not your input, because m is your size of your input. Right? That's true. So why does it make sense from an algorithm point of view to use n as your parameter to characterize your memory? Um, so others can correct me here, but I think a lot of this uh this intuition comes from the streaming setting. So from the streaming setting, you have um semi-streaming in which your memory that you use for semi-streaming settings in terms of n into, instead of m. And that's just the definition of the streaming setting. Okay. So I think the, the parameter chosen here is taken with respect to some, uh, some intuition from the streaming setting. Yes? Is there a model to take uh, into account the connectivity of the machine? Oh, the, it, that's a good question. Um, so the connectivity of, of the machine is uh, you assume a fully connected communication network. Um, so I think some some others here, including Paris and Xiao, have some uh, work on um, the setting when you're uh, not fully connected in terms of communication network. But for now, we're assuming a fully, communicate, uh, fully connected communication network. And you can send point-to-point -point messages. OK, great. So. Um, I just want to emphasize again, um, within each of these settings, you want to minimize the number of rounds of communication. So specifically, what the types of rounds that we generally allow um, are O of log log n rounds or O of 1 rounds. And we want total near linear space. Um, and of course, um, as in the database setting, we want the memory per machine to be sublinear in the total number of edges in the graph, so the total size of your input. 
Is there any intuition on why log login and not say log 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 in or log in? Oh yeah. So um, log log n. Um, I will actually show you a technique where log log n is is intuitive. So I'll actually show a bit later. Um, and so let me defer that question to when I show that technique. Um, and for the strongly sublinear memory um, setting. Uh, we often have delta to be a one half. So there's um, a variety of uh, recent work within the past four years on uh, graph algorithms in this specific MPC model. Um, and a lot of these works center around matching, um, but there's a variety of other problems that are still. Um, and within this model, we have some useful MPC primitives. Uh, that we can eh, perform in sublinear space, specifically near the square root of n space, where n is the size of your input here. So this is big N, not little n. So n is just the size of your input. And we can do all of this in constant number bounds. Um, so we can sum n integers. Uh, we can count distinct elements. Uh, we can perform prefix sum. So if you're given some n integers in order, you can uh, sum uh, for the i-th integer, you can sum every integer that came before that. And you can also do sorting. And for that, just to be sure, all of these are exact. Uh... Yes, they're all exact. Um, some, some have um, randomized algorithms. Okay. So now um, I'll show you a technique that gets you log log n rounds. So this technique um, doesn't get you constant, but uh, is a really cool technique that uses distributed graph algorithms in uh, the local distributed graph algorithm model, um, which I'll define. And this is called round compression. And the goal of this technique is to simulate multiple rounds of an iterative local distributed algorithm using a single MPC round. So this essentially shows that, uh, that this model has more power uh, than some, some distributed uh, models uh, for some problems. So what is this local model in the distributed setting? So this local model in the distributed setting is a fairly old model um, where you have a synchronous distributed algorithm where you assume each node is a processor or a computer. So instead of having a machine that can contain multiple nodes, multiple edges, you're assuming each node is itself a processor. And they communicate with their neighbors. Um, and the communication graph is actually defined uh, by the input graph. So instead of MPC, where you're assuming a fully connected communication graph, here, the communication graph is defined by the input graph that you're given. Okay, So you have some synchronous distributed algorithm. Each node is trying to compute some local value via communications with their neighbors. And what can you do in one synchronous round of communication? Uh, so each node can perform the following steps in this order. So they can perform some local computation. After they perform a local computation, they can send a point-to-point -point message to each of their neighbors. So they might send different messages to each of their neighbors. Um, some models, some broadcast uh, distributed models assume you send the same message, but here we're assuming point-to-point -point messages. And then finally, um, each node receives a message from each of its neighbors. So here I'm not assuming fully connected. No, world. yeah, that's right. Like yes, that's right. So here you have a topology for your communication network, which is your input graph. That's right. Each round you limit just a single message exchange between the neighbors, right? Yes, that's right. The round compression, for example, you compress k rounds, you also assume the number of messages that can be communicated between, for example, k between neighbors. Yeah, so when you do round compression, which I'll get into, um, it's all on one machine, but you can you can still assume that it's one message per round. Okay. 
Um, it's, it's everything when you do round compression, you're doing it on one machine. So okay. you, can, you can essentially do whatever you want because we don't consider local computation time. But if you want a direct simulation, you're still assuming one, one message sent between neighbors around. Okay, so this is your definition of a local model in the distributed setting. So now let me tell you how to do round compression using this, using these algorithms. Okay, so remember, now we have machines that can store more than one node per machine. So we want to do some local simulation uh, uh, per machine of these local distributed graph algorithms. So in this generalized procedure, we pick appropriate subgraphs of sufficiently small size where we send each subgraph to a single machine. So here's an example. We pick some appropriate subgraphs and we send it to a machine. So each subgraph goes to a single machine. Now, within each of these machines, we're doing some simulation of the local algorithm in each of these machines. So we're simulating this local algorithm on the induced subgraph within each of these machines. And then after doing the simulation, um, the machines send the results produced by the simulation of the local algorithm to the other machines. Okay, so this is a very general uh, description of round compression. So let me show you an example of how to do this uh, round compression on a very simplified example for a vertex cover. Okay. So here I'm looking at the minimum vertex cover and this problem is just defined on the graph uh, where each, has its, each edge in a graph is covered by at least one of its endpoints. And the minimization version of this problem is you want to find the minimum number of endpoints that cover every edge in the graph. So for this example graph, I think this is a minimum vertex cover um, for this example graph. So you can see every edge is covered by at least one of these two endpoints, and I, I believe this is the minimum number of vertices you pick for this, for this example. So what I'm going to show here is a um, very simplified version um, of the 2 plus epsilon approximate vertex cover algorithm um, by Ghaffari, Goliakis, uh, Conrad, Mitrovich, and Rubenfeld. Um, and what they actually get is uh, this approximation in near linear space per machine in all of log log n rounds. Um, but as I said, I'm going to present a simplified version. Uh, and in the simplified version, I'll put some constraints on the input so that it's easier to explain um, in a presentation. <coughs> so I said this example will be illustrating this uh, round compression algorithm. So I'm going to start by defining their uh, local algorithm that they use. So the local algorithm um, that they use is based on the primal dual method. So you can write an LP to formulate your vertex cover problem. So that's an LP on the left, that's your primal. And then of course you can formulate uh, a, the dual for your primal. Um, and this LP, there's a simple approximation scheme that gives you a two approximation um, using a, just solving uh, the relaxed version, the LP for the primal. So that gets you a two approximation via a simple rounding scheme. So let me explain um, these two LPs. So for the primal, what you want is each vertex has this variable, um, xu associated with vertex u. And you want for every edge, this variable associated with u plus this variable associated with v is greater than equal to one. So in the integral case, uh, each edge is covered by at least one of their endpoints. So in the dual, uh, this is uh, the formulation for the dual, the intuitive uh, definition for the dual. Um, and instead of having a variable for every node, you instead have a variable for every edge. And the summation 
for every vertex, the summation of the edge variables uh, for each of the edges adjacent to that vertex is at most one. So for every vertex, you have this constraint where the summation of your edge variables uh, adjacent to that vertex is at most one. Yes. Just checking, is it the same thing as the edge packing problem we saw before today? Uh, yes, so this is a fractional matching problem. Yes. So uh, you can, yes. Matching or edge packing racism? Uh, fractional matching. Same thing. I believe it's equivalent, yes. Is there like an integral gap here? Yes. Yeah. So um, for the primal, you have all nodes uh, covered up by at least one endpoint. For the dual, you have the fractional matching. Okay, so here is your local algorithm for this problem. So there's a sequential version of this problem, um, but I'll present the local version. And the local version gives you a 2 plus epsilon approximate value uh, via weak duality. So here's a local algorithm. Initially, you set all of these edge variables to be one over delta. So delta is defined to be the maximum degree of any vertex in the graph. So you initially set all of these uh, edge variables to one over delta. And then you repeat the following procedure um, until uh, you reach some stopping condition. And the stopping condition is all the edges are frozen. So I'll tell you what frozen means as I go through the procedure. So let's say you're in iteration t, okay? So for iteration t, you freeze a vertex and all of its adjacent edges if the summation of uh, the edge variables for that vertex is greater than or equal to one minus two epsilon. You're given epsilon, right? You're given epsilon. Epsilon, is, we can assume some constant. Um, yeah, constant in between zero and one. So this is the definition of freeze. So as long as all of your adjacent variables to your vertex exceed some boundary, which is one minus two epsilon, you freeze that vertex at all its adjacent edges. Sorry, are you freezing edges or vertices? You're freezing edges when you freeze a vertex. So when you freeze a vertex, you freeze all of its adjacent edges. Yeah. Um, so edge freezing depends on the adjacent, any adjacent vertex freezing. So, but you could have when you're freezing a vertex, some of the adjacent edges were frozen and some are not. So you just freeze the ones that. Yeah, they freeze the ones that, that haven't been frozen yet. That's right. That's right. Um, so for each active, which is defined as non-frozen edge, um, at the end of freezing, you um, increase is uh, weight by one over one minus epsilon. So recall we're saying epsilon is some constant. Uh, in between zero and one. So you're increasing the weight. Okay. So you repeat this until all of the um, edges are frozen. So this is the stopping condition is on freezing all of the edges. And recall we're freezing the edges because we're freezing vertices. Stopping condition is freezing edges. And then you return the set of frozen vertices as your vertex cover. And what can show using weak uh, duality that this gives you a 2 plus epsilon approximation on your vertex cover. Um, and now you can do this in old log n rounds. And the base here is 1 over 1 minus epsilon. Yes? Can um, y e by 1 minus epsilon be more than 1? Uh, the fraction one over one minus epsilon. When you set the new uh, y of an edge to be uh, a scaled up version of it, can it be uh, violate? Um... Ah, okay. So um, because you're freezing when you have one minus two over epsilon, two minus one minus two epsilon, um, you freeze it before it violates the constraint. Thanks. So that's your local algorithm. Now I'll show you 
how to use this uh, in round compression. Okay, so I'm making some, some very much simplifying assumptions. So the first assumption I'm making is um, you assume the maximum degree in your input graph is O of n to the 1 over 9. So your maximum degree is sublinear. Okay. Now, um, the second assumption I'm making is that you can do this easily in constant number of rounds. So assume we can do some partitioning of the graph into subgraphs of radius 8. Okay. So you can partition the graph easily into subgraphs of radius 8. And then you give the entire graph of radius 8 to a single machine. Okay. So once you have this entire subgraph in a single machine, you're running the local algorithm on each of these machines for this many rounds. So specifically log delta over 10 rounds. And I'll, 10 is somewhat arbitrary, um, but it has to be a large enough constant on the denominator. And I'll show some calculations here. So you're running this local algorithm. So you're doing the simulation of the local algorithm. For this simplified case, you can assume you're doing an exact simulation of the local algorithm I just discussed. But the local algorithm is running just on the subgraph. Just on the subgraph on each machine. Cover on that subgraph. Yes. You're, you're running your exact local algorithm in the simplified version on the subgraph that's on your machine. How about the boundary of the subgraph? Oh, yes. So the boundary of subgraph, I'll, I'll discuss. Yeah. OK. Um, and then uh, you find the new graph after removing the frozen vertices in your run of the simulation. Um, frozen vertices and edges. So there's two things I need to discuss here. So first, uh, why do we want to run this many rounds as opposed to running arbitrary number of large number of rounds? So the problem here exactly is the boundary vertices. So you don't want to run too many rounds such that each of your machines, if you have a boundary vertex and some of its adjacent edges are on some machines and some of its adjacent edges are on other machines, you don't want the sum of all the edge variables to exceed um, one when you aggregate the information across all the machines. So this is why we can't actually run arbitrary number of rounds here. So we have to run a bounding number of rounds. But this number of rounds has to be large enough to obtain this next property that I'll, I'll tell you about. OK. And this has to be large enough such that you can increase your radius next time you're running this algorithm. So for this example, I'll set the new radius to 9, and I'll repeat the above with the new radius. And you keep repeating this while increasing the radius until you can fit all of the graph on one machine. And then you just solve it on that one machine. Does so after you... Does t remain the same, or it also depends on the radius? Is that 10 in the denominator? Ah, 10 is the same. 10 is the same. Um, no dependence on the, on the radius. Yes? For this like, partitioning step in the beginning, like. Who exactly is doing this? Like, it's not a specific machine, right? Ah, yes. The partitioning step, I'm hiding under a simplified version that you can assume you can do this easily. This is a big assumption, big assumption uh, for the purposes of this presentation. Yes. So, so it's an algorithm locally freezes some vertices. Yes. And then you compute, you compute a new global graph or a new local graph? You compute a new global graph. And then you repartition. You repartition using the global graph. Yes. Okay. That's right. So the global so graph, you do. Reducing size as you go. Yes, exactly. And I'm going to show how to reduce this graph as you go. So why does this work? Here's a few things. So um, because of our assumptions, because of all these assumptions, um, this part uses sublinear memory. So using radius 8 plus this assumption on the max degree and assuming you can partition the graph easily. You use sublinear memory here. Um, and here is the crux of the, of the analysis. So we showed that running the local algorithm in this many rounds means that the minimum weight on any edge becomes delta to the negative 0 0.9. Okay. So how do, you, how do you calculate this? So each of the load on each of the 
edges, you initially start with one over delta. And each time, each round, you're increasing the load by a factor of one over one minus epsilon. And you're running this for um, this log delta over 10 rounds. So you can simplify how large this load gets. So this load on every edge that, that remains unfrozen, so every active edge, becomes at least delta to the negative 0 0.9. And what does this mean? This means that you're doing this every single, every single time you run this entire algorithm. So after the i-th iteration of running this entire algorithm of this partitioning and running the local algorithm, your weight on each edge after the i-th iteration becomes delta to the negative 0 0.9 to the i. So, the, so your weight increases doubly exponentially, which also means your maximum degree de decreases doubly exponentially. So your maximum degree after the i-th iteration actually becomes 1 over delta to the negative 0 0.9 to the i. So delta to 0 0.9 to the i after the i-th iteration. And the reason for this is because if you have a degree greater than this, your vertex will get frozen during that round. So all the edges adjacent to that will get frozen. Okay. Because you're um, decreasing the maximum degree doubly exponentially, you need old log log n rounds. Great. Um, so this is round compression. Uh, and the reason why we call this round compression is because we just compressed O of log n rounds in the local model to O of log log n and PC rounds. And this um, doubly exponential increase is actually used in quite a few papers. Um, and the reason why we often obtain uh, O of log log n rounds uh, in the MPC model. Because a lot of local models use O of log n rounds. Yes? Um, is there a meta theorem that says you can turn a message passing algorithm into, because what you showed us is just one example. Yes. And it seems to be a little brittle in terms of setting the parameters. Yes. yes. There are, um, so um, I believe Kirchhoff has a manuscript that does this for bounded degree graphs. So local algorithms for bounded degree input graphs. Um, I believe he has a he has a conversion for that. Um, but um, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, there, the meta theorem was not for all general graphs. I believe there doesn't exist a meta theorem for general graphs. So it's fake any graph skew. Mm. <laughs> yep. Yep. We're assuming unique edges, unique vertices. Yes. So if we apply this on a bad graph, uh, do we compress it down to two uh, iterations? Uh, on the compressed graph. Uh, on a path graph. On a path graph. Um, I believe it's still log log n. Oh, I guess for a path graph, you have all of, all of n edges, so you can just put it on one machine in near linear setting. Oh. So it, it, when your number of edges is uh, close to n, you can just put it on one machine in yeah. our definition of a near linear setting. Wait, but you want some linear space there, right? Oh, we, we don't have sublinear space uh, for, for this result. It's a sublinear space given my very big assumptions. <laughs> yeah. So this, this result um, works in uh, near linear space. And we actually have conditional lower bounds based on fine grain complexity um, that shows that uh, if you, you can't obtain a little of log log n rounds for a sublinear space. Yeah, so um, these lower bounds are fine grain. So I believe it's um, a, assuming um, the hardness of uh, connectivity um, in little of log n rounds in MPC model. This lower bound holds for vertex Yes, I believe so. It holds for matching. Uh, I believe the paper also includes vertex cover for constant approximation. Wait, so what is exactly saying that if you want to do sublinear space in n mm -hmm. per machine? Sublinear space in n per machine. Yes. Then you need at, at least a non-constant, like log log n rounds. Log log n rounds near linear total space. Okay. 
Okay. Oh, linear. Near, near linear total space. Okay. Also assuming this. Also assuming yes. Okay. Um, and there's an improvement to average, average degree um, in this most recent paper by Gafari, uh, uh, Jing, and Milis. Wait, but then if you have. Oh. Okay. All right. Um, so let me quickly go over the second technique, which is random partitional vertices. So a lot of papers do random partitional vertices. So they can actually extend um, their algorithm to the very general setting without any of the simplifying assumptions um, using a random partitioning of vertices um, plus some other techniques. So they do a slightly different simulation of their local algorithm. So it's not the local algorithm I presented, but a slightly different variation of that. Okay, so let me um, quickly talk about random partitioning of vertices in our favorite problem, triangle counting. Um, and uh, I don't need to define triangle counting here, but here's the oblig obligatory um, uh, set of practical uses for triangle counting. Um, uh, so what can we do here? So uh, triangle counting, you can estimate the number of triangles to one plus epsilon approximation um, by randomly partitioning the vertices on one of the machines. So first algorithm we can consider, randomly partition your vertices, find an induced subgraph in each machine, and then each machine counts the number of triangles in their induced subgraph. And then you can sum up the number of triangles in each machine and then return this value, which is t times one over q. Uh, one over q is a probability um, of sampling into your machines. Okay, so um, using second moment method, uh, we need Q to be at least um, this, this expression here. So let me explain what this expression means um, in order to get a concentration bound. Um, so this expression says delta E is the maximum number of triangles that are adjacent to any edge E. And T real is the number of triangles that you actually have in your graph. Okay. Um, and we want to do this in near linear space per machine. So that means that um, Q squared, uh, which is the probability of any edge ending up in a machine. So your edge ends up in a machine if both of its vertices are partitioned to that machine. So Q squared is the number of probability any edge ends up in the machine. So the expected number of edges you'll get in any machine is Q squared times M. You want near linear memory. So you can plug in uh, this expression for Q, uh, Q squared here, um, and solve for T real. So T real then gives you um, this bound is greater than or equal to the average degree, um, I guess when your number of triangles I share an edge is at least square root of the average degree. So what this means is that you get a one plus epsilon approximation in near linear space when the number of triangles is at least the average degree of your graph. Okay, um, so we can actually do slightly better than that when you increase um, the total space slightly. So our, our result here, um, we can actually get a one plus epsilon approximation when uh, the number of triangles is at least square root of the average degree. Okay, um, and the caveat is we slightly have worse, we have a slightly worse total space. So we have some polylogs in the total space compared to um, exactly O of n previously. And we unfortunately don't get sublinear space. It's an open problem whether we can get sublinear space. So there's no lower bounds for triangle counting here. So that's an interesting open problem. Okay, so I'll now discuss. Um, and basically the algorithm is instead of partitioning, you're just sampling the vertices, okay? So each vertex gets sampled with replacement into a machine into a machine uh, with probability Q. And we'll, I will actually set probability Q later. So it's not the same probability Q as before. Um, it's a different prob probability Q. Okay, so each vertex gets sampled into a machine with replacement with probability Q. Um, as before, we count the number of triangles in the machine uh, in the induced subgraph of the vertices that are sampled into the machine. 
Um, and we use the total count of this triangle as an estimator. Um, and we also uh, repeat this in parallel of log n times. So with, uh, we repeat this entire process uh, using copies with independent sources of randomness to get a concentration bound uh, using median trick. So there's a number of challenges uh, which we solve. The first is, of course, the induced subgraphs do not exceed the space per machine. The second is how do you compute the induced subgraph in each machine when one edge can appear on multiple machines? Or, or one vertex and also one edge can appear in multiple machines. Um, and you want to, of course, show concentration bounds. Okay, so careful setting of Q um, you need to account for for both challenge one and challenge three. Um, and challenge two is that we're assuming some k-wise independent hash functions for small enough k. So we can actually show this for um, log n, uh, some poly log n um, wise independent hash functions. And then finally, um, each of our simulations gets some constant probability of success. Um, and we use the median trick across our log n simulations with independent randomness to get our uh, high probability bound. Okay, um, so let me, let me show you the quick proof uh, for the lower bound on the number of triangles. Um, so magically, we got this uh, Q um, using, using uh, our uh, calculation for getting a uh, high probability bound. Um, so just assume we have this Q for the probability. Okay, so T, has to be large enough that we see at least one triangle. And so each triangle appears on a machine uh, with probably the Q uh, cubed times the number of triangle times the number of machines. So big M is the number of machines. It sends uh, Q squared times M, assuming near linear memory, um, equals this expression. So this expression is already omega 1. So we just need to show that Q times T is omega 1. So we already know near linear memory, we, this expression is omega 1. We just need to show this. OK. Um, so it suffices to show that T is omega of 1 over Q. And with a setting of Q, uh, we get that T is omega of n over s. If we assume near linear memory, that is the square root of the average degree. Um, and finally, um, there are a number of nice class notes um, that I've seen uh, throughout the years. Here are some nice class notes if you want to learn more about this particular MPC model. There are others, um, but uh, here are two examples. And in terms of open questions and future directions, um, overall, we want to extend this result for small subgraph counting. So we're able to do this for some small subgraphs, we want, but we want to have a generalized, um, some generalization of what types of subgraphs we can do. Um, of course, we want to decrease the space per machine usage. So we want to have some results in the sublinear memory per machine. And Maybe an easier problem in that domain is perhaps we can consider some sparse graphs to begin with. So sparse graphs in the sublinear memory per machine study. All right. And that's it. Um, happy to take any additional questions. Thank you. Time for one quick question. Hong has already on the uh, uh, so when you say you, you repeat this log n time, this yes. counting, do you do do you really do it in log n rounds, or can you just do it in one round by yeah. adding more machines? Yeah, you just add more machines. Okay. You do it in parallel, so we we guarantee constant number of rounds. Okay. So you don't want to do synchronous all log n rounds. You want to do everything in parallel. So it's just an independent instance that you're running in parallel. Okay, but with an independent source of random. Right? Yeah, you get near linear. This is why we get near linear because we have some polylog and factors because of the repeating, repeating instances of uh, the simulation. I should respect so Do you gain anything by considering the degree of the vertices in the uh, 
probability of sampling? Um, I mean, get anything in terms of uh, better results? Um, we have not considered that, but potentially. All right, so we get back here at two. Uh, so as a reminder, we're, we have I think, four, yeah, four questions. Approximately. Approximately. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Uh, and then, like yesterday, kind of break up into groups uh, and come back to report that.